Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining today. Um, this is one of the Unicorn uh, seminars um, organized as part of the British Optomechanical Research Network. Um, today we're really excited to have a first ever uh, virtual panel discussion and we'd like to thank all of the uh, panel uh, members for joining today and we're really really excited um, for this event. Um, so just before we start, so could I ask everyone who's not on the panel to please um, mute your microphone and video um, while the panel discussion is going on. And um, we will, the format for today is as follows. We'll first start with an introduction by the speakers about um, themselves and their work and um, how their work and their thoughts relates to um, the topic of this panel discussion, which is often mechanical interfaces or quantum mechanics and gravity. Um, and then afterwards, we'll go, we'll go through three um, questions uh, that are relevant to this topic. And then uh, as the last stage of this panel discussion, um, we will take questions from the audience. And um, we expect this event to maybe run for one and a half hours rather than just one hour today. So we hope that you can stay until the very end. And just before you leave, we will also ask you to do a quick survey because we changed our format for the Unicorn Seminars this year. Um, and we'd like your thoughts on it. Um, so without further ado, I'll uh, hand over to Hendrik, who will uh, introduce our speakers. Thank you so, so much. Yes, uh, th thanks, uh, Sophia. And um, uh, thank you all for coming and uh, for, for having this discussion here. So we, we do the panel discussion in a moment. And I will um, introduce uh, the, the panelists to you. Um, I, I just thought that maybe it's a good idea to um, so that we have like a starting point for the discussion to say very briefly, um, you know, what, what is actually the topic we want to discuss and why. Um, so um, I think that, you know, many, many of us agree that um, there is a great opportunity which came with uh, improvement of uh, experiments, basically with uh, quantum technologies, if you want. And um, now we are, we are able to do uh, experiments uh, which maybe um, give reason to believe that we can ask again this question about uh, the overlap of quantum mechanics and gravity. Um, and um, that is very much what we want to discuss and we want to uh, look a bit closer into detail. So on one hand, the experimental part. So what are these experiments? What do we need in those experiments to be able to, to study the, uh, the overlap or the interplay um, of, of quantum mechanics and gravity. And when I say gravity, I, of course, uh, don't restrict it to a specific way to think about gravity. So other people say relativity. So also that, of course, it's, it's, it's open for discussion what we, what we may, may think there. Um, so, so that means that there is also, of course, a, a theoretical part to that question. So what, is, what are the concepts? What are the ideas which we want to test with, with those experiments? And um, so, um, again, I, I don't want to talk too much. That is basically very briefly to describe um, the starting point. Um, what I wanted to do also before, before I uh, uh, introduce the panel members is to say hello to Roger, Roger Penrose. So he has joined this discussion here today. Uh, it's great to have you. Um, and um, just let me say that a good part of the stuff we're discussing here is only um, uh, you know, and very strongly related to, to the work you have done um, already many years ago. Uh, so you, you gave us all great inspiration for, um, you know, thinking about gravity in, in quantum systems and um, related questions. So great to have you. Um, so now let's, uh, let me just uh, introduce the panel members. Um, so we have um, Yvette Fuentes from University of Southampton. Um, hello, Yvette, great Hi. to have you. Um, we have uh, Chaslav Bruckner from uh, the ECOCI and the University of Vienna in Austria. Hi, Chaslav. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Um, we have Miles Blanco from uh, Dartmouth College uh, in the US, where they have a lot of snow at the moment and ice, uh, he, he told us. Um, hi, Miles. Great to have you. I hope Miles is there. Yeah, he yeah, was earlier. Here. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> hi, great. Good to see you. There's Gary Steele from, from, uh, from Delft, from the Technical University of Delft. Uh, he's joining the panel. Hi, Gary. Great to have Hello. you. Nice to be here. Um, there's also Andrew Geraci, Andrew Geraci from Northwestern University. Uh, that is in Chicago in the US. Uh, also a lot of snow there. Hi, Andy. Great to have you. 
Hi, everyone. And then last not least, we have Angelo Bassi from University of Trieste, where I think there's sunshine and almost, uh, you know, weather to go and have a swim. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> that was yesterday. That was yesterday. <laughs> oh, today okay, anyway. good. But still it's pleasant. Hello, everybody. Yes. Okay, so that, that is, that's the panel. Um, uh, welcome to, to that discussion on quantum mechanics and gravity. Um, now, the next part of our program is that we give basically to each of you, each of the panelists, something like three minutes time slot to talk about, uh, you know, your interest, your research, if you do experiments, if you more working on theory, what is your take on the question where you think, um, you know, are the interesting and important questions really to ask. So, of course, we know that when it comes to, to find something new, to ask the right question is actually a very important part of, of the game. So, you know, just um, in no particular order, um, I, will, I will just, you know, ask you to, to, to talk about your, your research on, on the topic. So, Yvette, please, if you, if you would like to start your three-minute uh, introduction. Sorry, to please let me know when to stop. Sorry, Yvette, can I, can I just very quickly make a point? Really sorry to interrupt you. So um, because we are streaming this to YouTube, we'd like to ask everyone who's not on the panel to please turn off the video so that the, um, the video only captures those uh, on the panel. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sophia. Yes, so, um, well, quantum mechanics and general relativity are incompatible. And finding a theory that allows us to discuss the interplay of quantum effects and, and relativistic effects, I think it's one of the most important open questions in physics right now. And people have been trying to do this for many years in, in many ways with uh, relatively good success or, or not. But um, we have like pieces of a puzzle well together. And I think that the most important thing right now is to get experiments that help us uh, develop more uh, fundamental theory. So we have really been missing that feedback between theory and experiment that allows us to come up with more meaningful theories. And like Henrik was saying, right now we're at the brink of having a lot of quantum experiments reach relativistic uh, scale. So we're like in very exciting times right now. I think the most important thing is to think about experiments that help us figure out which are the fundamental notions in quantum mechanics and general relativity that we have to keep and which ones we can let go of. You know? So uh, I think that is um, a key thing. And there's experiments that are reaching these scales in different ways, for example, being able to have massive superpositions and um, I, uh, of, of, obviously of quantum systems. I think this is perhaps the most important question that we might have. We want to find out if the gravitational field can be in a quantum state. So uh, for example, we know that the electromagnetic field can be in a quantum state. We can put charges in different superpositions and they produce a um, electromagnetic field and the electromagnetic field can be quantized. We know that from experiments, but we don't know if gravity behaves like that. So if we have a massive system, it will curve space time. But if this massive system is in a superposition, it will make space time be in a superposition of two different configurations. And we don't understand if space time can behave in that way or not. So that's a key question. Other experiments that are reaching relativistic regimes would be space-based experiments with very long baselines. So we uh, people can do um, distribute entanglement across different cities in the planet. And uh, at scales where uh, satellites operate, relativity clicks in. So that's another area that we're not going to discuss so much today. And the other thing is very high precision. Atomic clocks have a precision of 10 to the minus 18. And at those really high precisions, you start seeing at very small scales in a centimeter that space time is curved. So we're really reaching these scales and it's very important. And I'm very excited as a theorist to see what these experiments can say so we can start doing uh, better uh, theories. So I work on proposing experiments. That's one of the things um, because you were saying, well, talk about what do you think are the most important questions and how they, they relate to your work. So um, on one hand, I, I am proposing some experiments for space-based um, um, quantum communications and, and metrology to estimate space-time parameters of the Earth. I'm also working with Bose-Einstein condensates, which are like 10 to the 
six, 10 to the eight particles cool down to the ground state and they become very sensitive. It's like having 10 to the eight of these very precise atomic clocks, but all together to measure gravitational waves or uh, do searches of dark matter, constrain dark energy models. So that's another area of research I'm interested in. And I've also been working with, um, with Roger on alternative ways of testing gravitational induced collapse. So he came up with this idea that space time doesn't like to be in this superposition. Well, that's a way, uh, a, a simplistic way of putting it. And that the, the state of massive superpositions should collapse due to self gravity effects. And well, many of the people here have proposed very interesting, very nice experiments to test this. Uh, it's very challenging. And people have been looking at using beads, diamonds, mirrors, and different sort of solid systems. What I've been working is with both Einstein condensates, in which uh, when you reach very high temperatures, all the atoms in the condensate, their wave function overlap, and they behave like a lump. So in a double well potential, in principle, you could create a superposition of the lump in the left and right well. But the system is very different because um, contrary to solids, in which the atoms are all bounded together and you can't really like separate the atoms out, in this system, the atoms can tunnel from one well to another. So the states are very rich. They're very different from the states of solids. And we're sort of finding ways of using this to find evidence of um, uh, self-energy. So that's another line of research and please let me know when my three minutes are up because i like talking and i can yeah i i think i think i missed it uh, slightly the three minutes but oh, thanks wait. a lot for already you know this this long introduction with so much details and uh, i'm sure we will come back to some of the points in a later discussion i have seen from the reactions of of the other panel members that they want to jump in and they want to say something so we we, we we leave the discussion for now and we go to chaslav and i ask chaslav to um, you know, also say some words about, uh, you know, your take on, on the topic. Uh, thanks, Hendrik. Uh, well, so Yvette opened her introductory three minutes with this statement that general relativity and quantum theory are incompatible. And that's a statement that we very often read in scientific articles as a motivation for the work at the interface between quantum theory and general relativity. And I'm not sure if I would agree with this. And uh, with due res respect of also to Roger Penrose, who, who is listening to us, I have not seen enough evidences to give up the possibility uh, of learning how we should merge and combine these two theories. There is, however, a challenge. And I think this is the greatest challenge right now. And the challenge is that to learn how uh, uh, these two theories that are based on different concepts can be put together to make new predictions. Quantum theory on one hand, in one of its formulation is a very operational theory. It tells us what we should we do in the laboratory to predict certain or see uh, outcomes with certain probabilities. It's in operational terms based on uh, primitive laboratory operations, preparations, transformations, measurements. On the other hand, General relativity looks as if it has a, def, a, a different ontological status. It talks about space time or how uh, fields, classical quantum fields, are embedded in this space time. There is no much space for a laboratory and even less for an agent. So, what I think is the challenge of the next uh, uh, years to come is to operationalize general relativity. And this is an idea that also comes from Lucien Hardy, but I don't think we have reached this moment. Uh, and from there on then, maybe to go even a step further and try to find out how we would make sense in our operational terms of quantum gravity. And now as you also ask about our individual contributions towards these goals, I just let briefly mention two research directions of my group towards this goal. This is research on indefinite causal order and on quantum reference frames. An indefinite causal order is the idea that in a quantum gravity setup where the metric fluctuates or has some quantum mechanical uncertainty, 
the spatial temporal distance between events will not be well defined. And if the spatial temporal difference between events is not well defined, we cannot say, not in advance, whether the two events will be space-like or time-like separated or even first, in a sense, whether event E be, will be before or after event B. And so then there is a very hard to think about any theory in which the causal order is not definite. An idea of indefinite causal order is to make sense out, even out of such a, a chaotical, so to say, unordered uh, situation and still be able to make predictions about probabilities in laboratories. And the second is a quantum reference means which is closely related to this. And this is again the idea that um, maybe general relativity should be in a certain sense extended. Uh, one of the main ideas of general relativity is so-called general covariance, namely the, the uh, under arbitrary coordinate transformation, the idea that our, the form of the physical laws preserved are the same independently of our choice of the coordinates. But coordinates are always attached to physical systems and physical systems are ultimately quantum mechanical. So maybe we should think also about some kind of quantum coordinates and general covariance and the change of quantum coordinates. That's all for the first. Okay, thanks Stratlov. So that was a very different view. Uh, thanks a lot for that. And we move on to the next uh, panel member, Miles. Uh, Miles Blanco. So, Miles, please uh, give us your take on the story. Sure. So, let me just first begin uh, by telling you a little bit about um, where I where I've come from. So, I did my PhD in quantum gravity, and then I moved into condensed matter theory physics, theoretical physics. And um, about twenty years or so, uh, we started to think about how we might prepare um, small mechanical oscillators in superpositions of two states quantum superpositions of two states. And uh, that this, this area um, has grown considerably. And uh, you know, one of the, the um, uh, uh, terms in, in the title for this, uh, this seminar is, uh, is optomechanics. And so um, as a theorist, I've been working with experimentalists uh, to see how we can possibly make macroscopic superposition states. And by that, I mean um, large masses and superpositions and maybe a few micrometers or more. And ways to do this involve uh, coupling quantum bits of various kinds, uh, making a quantum bit in a superposition, uh, and then using that to prepare the mechanical oscillator in a superposition, or using light pressure. And hopefully we'll have more discussions of this about this in, 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 in this uh, the next hour or so. Uh, more recently, um, I kind of went back to my original interest, which is uh, gravity, uh, quantum gravity, and uh, you know, making these macroscopic mass superpositions. Uh, 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 we ask, why can't we see them in nature? And the common understanding is is because of no system is is closed; it's open; it couples to an environment. And and. Uh, making a superposition, it rapidly de decoheres due to um, uh, mostly electromagnetic environment. But what if we could get rid of the electromagnetic environment by, by shielding our experiments, maybe putting it in ultra high vacuum? Well, there's, there's one environment that we cannot get rid of and that is gravity. And uh, so, so I, I was very curious about um, and inspired by Roger's work um, in particular, but very curious about having a, a coming up with a quantitative um, calculation of, of the effect of gravity in causing decoherence. And uh, just based on my background, and I, I felt that to, to do this calculation properly, one has to use a field theoretic approach. Uh, and where does one start? One starts with Einstein's theory of general relativity coupled to uh, scalar matter. But uh, in addition, um, uh, it doesn't seem necessary, at least to begin with, to take the full theory, the full nonlinear theory. Why not work with the, the kind of low energy um, uh, weak theory? Because after all, we're talking about uh, experiments in, in the lab, low energy experiments in a terrestrial lab, for example. Um, so I did a calculation and it came up with a result. Um, but I also should mention um, some very important work by Karas Anastopoulos and Belak Ku and Theodora Oniga and Charles Wang and 
Um, Angelo himself has worked on this, but again, thinking of a field theoretic, field theoretic way to do this calculation. But I don't think my, my, my earlier work is, is, is the, the final answer. And, uh, and, and I think there's a lot more to be understood. And it gets actually to something that, um, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, Chaslov was just telling us. And we really need an operational calculation of decoherence, gravitational induced decoherence. And by that, I mean, we have to include the observables in our, in our calculation. Um, a technical point, um, usually when we look at decoherence, we are just calculating the density matrix, the off-diagonal terms and watching them go away. But the density operator is not a gauge invariant quantity. Um, and so we really need to include the observables in our calculation. And, and so the work I'm, work, I'm doing now is, is to have a field, fully field theoretic calculation, but also including um, uh, some kind of interferometric interferometric way to um, extract decoherence in an operational way. Gravity can be made just as operational as quantum manic mechanics. And all that, but what that requires is to take into account the observables, how you measure um, the effects of gravity. So I'll stop there, thank you. Okay, thanks, Miles. Yeah, I, I also hope we have, we have time and opportunity to dig a little bit deeper in some of the points which you mentioned, so that is, uh, that, that's really cool stuff. Uh, so for now, we move on with our next uh, panel member, Gary Steele. So Gary, uh, please, can you enlighten us with your sight on the topic? I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, so uh, I come from a little, a little bit of a different background. I'm an experimentalist. Uh, so uh, and where my interest in this, this topic comes from is that we are working on experiments where we where we are trying to literally make quantum superpositions of heavy objects. Uh, so uh, we do this using mechanical resonators, actually. And we do that uh, by coupling these mechanical resonators to superconducting circuits, a bit like what Miles was just saying. Uh, and uh, our, our, yeah, let's say as, as experimentalists, our homework is try to uh, make quantum superpositions of the, of the object that are as large as possible try to displace the, the mechanical object out of itself. Uh, and for that, we use, uh, you know, uh, you know all, we try to make the most uses we can out of all of the, the technology of, of superconducting qubits and that has been built up for this massive effort of quantum computing. And, uh, you know, of, of course, if we can do that, we can start to ask the question, can we start to test some of, uh, of the things uh, that might happen of, of, of a massive quantum superposition. And, uh, and then th th that would be super cool. I think these are all super fascinating questions uh, about how to combine gravitation, uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics. And then the question uh, for me becomes, uh, you know, what do I have to do? Uh, how big does my superposition have to be? Uh, is this something I can uh, achieve in a lab? Uh, and and what sort of things do we need to do in the clean room and in our dilution fridges uh, to make that possible? Uh, and so that's actually in addition to listening to all the super interesting uh, topics that that we'll we'll cover today uh, to understand deep more deeply what this could all mean. We also want to uh, to know sort of very concretely uh, what's our homework and, and what do we need to do. And uh, and of course the, one of the challenges is that there is no theory. Uh, how these should be combined. So it's not like there's a, 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 an answer that says the answer must be so, you know, you need to make a superposition of this big with this much mass. And that, that, at least that's something that we have trouble coming up with a clear answer if we look at the literature. And so I hope that maybe some of these discussions will also help us point us in the right way and see if we can bark up the right tree. Okay, thanks, Gary. Um, uh, the next is Andy, Andrew uh, Gracie. So Andy, please uh, give your three minute pitch. Sure, yeah. So my interest in the subject of being able to measure potentially quantum effects in, in gravity uh, goes back to my time as a PhD student uh, where we were interested in testing a number of theories that uh, Oh, so we may have lost Andy there. Um, I, don't I know think if you, if you carry on with the next person, I will try and get hold of okay. Andy. Yeah. 
Okay, so the next person would be Angelo. Uh, so Angelo, do you want to jump in and uh, give your three minute starting introduction? Sure, thank you, Andre. So I'm, I'm, I work as a theoretical physicist on the foundations of quantum mechanics and related to the big questions that uh, have also been addressed before, one can say perhaps that from the foundational point of view, we are really not understanding physics at all. There is no agreement about the meaning of quantum theory. It, it's a theory that works very well, but it's not the foundations of the theory are not clear. It's the so-called measurement problem. One could uh, argue more about that. And there is not really an agreement on the, on the meaning of the theory related to, to uh, the description of reality. But something similar is also, for, uh, is also true for, for general relativity. It's a very successful theory as well, but probably many people would say that probably it's not the fundamental theory of gravity. When you go to very high energy or very small distances, something might change because of quantum effects or for uh, other reasons. So the two big questions are related to quantum theory and gravity separately. And also there is the third big, big, big question, which uh, has been addressed uh, already um, about the combination of the two. There is no successful quantum theory of gravity. And the reason why the strive forward quantization program didn't work, contrary to what happened to the other forces of nature, is not really, really clear. Is it because gravity uh, is something intimately different from quantum mechanics and therefore uh, you have to treat it differently? Is, did we hit a problem with quantum theory uh, itself or whatever? So these are big questions that uh, so far are uh, mainly theoretical questions in the sense that, uh, that uh, ma uh, many experiments uh, in order to answer these questions are coming or still have to come, but haven't come yet. And then uh, uh, on a on a more specific level, the question that Yvette raised at the very beginning, so what happens to a superposition of two masses? Does it create a superposition of gravity, a superposition of space-time, something happened? Will gravity break, uh, will gravity cause to the breakdown of quantum superpositions as uh, Roger Penrose and other people have suggested? These are very interesting questions that now are even more interesting because are, are coming into the realm of experimental uh, um, exploration. And that's part of my work to, the, to understand whether uh, quantum theory is correct, whether the superposition principle is correct at all scales or not. Okay, thank you, Angelo. Um, so I don't know if you have Andy back. Uh, yes, so I, uh, sorry about that. My internet died at exactly the wrong moment there for a minute. <laughs> okay, now here are your three minutes. Yeah, sorry, I'm not sure where we left off. But I'll be very, very brief. I was just mentioning, so I'm an experimentalist who I've been interested in this topic of being able to measure quantum effects related to gravity for quite a while since my uh, PhD work, where we did a, a precision experiment with cryogenic uh, micromechanical oscillators to basically test whether uh, Newton's inverse square law uh, holds between masses when you bring them very, really close together. So there are some theoretical suggestions from string theory or other kind of beyond the standard model uh, physics, including supersymmetry, uh, that uh, maybe the gravitational inverse square law will actually not hold uh, and have and pick on some corrections when you bring things sufficiently close together. So um, since that work now I'm in, in our lab, we've sort of adopted a new uh, technology to try to answer similar questions where now we're using levitated optomechanical systems as ultra precise sensors to be able to uh, look at the same question, what is the nature of, of gravity at, at these very short distances? And uh, more recently, we're also interested in potentially producing quantum superpositions of these levitated particles, uh, as it's already been mentioned by several of the panelists, where eventually we, we aim to potentially be able to ask questions for related to how gravity participates, for example, in entangling to, to quantum systems. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Andy. Um, and uh, okay, so thanks to all of you. Th thanks to all of our panelists for, for this introduction. So, so with this, I, I close, so to say, the first part of this, uh, of this event. And uh, the next will be to, um, to, to discuss, to start a discussion really uh, on, on three different questions, which we have selected and also um, discussed in, in, in the session with, with, with all the panelists before. So um, now the first question, which, which I will uh, try to moderate a bit, um, um, and uh, that is the, um, the question, I will, I will read it to you and then I will hand back to Andy, who, who will kick off basically the dis discussion on this and then uh, we will, we will um, you know, invite other uh, panelist members uh, to, to come in and to discuss this point. So the first question is, 
in which experiments might we observe an interplay between quantum mechanical and gravitational effects? Okay, Andy, over to you again. Yes, thanks. Yeah, I'll try to hopefully not have my internet die at the wrong moment here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so this is a, um, a great question. Um, so uh, as I was just mentioning a, a moment ago, um, I've spent some part of my career looking at trying to experimentally measure uh, gravitational effects in order to potentially detect quantum mechanical signatures. Uh, one of the big uh, challenges here has to do with uh, basically how weak the gravitational force is relative to the other standard model forces. So to give folks a sense of scale, for example, if you look at, say, the electromagnetic repulsion between two protons that would be maybe inside of a nucleus, uh, and then ask how strong is that repulsion relative to the gravitational attraction uh, between them, you'd, you'd find about 36 orders of magnitude difference uh, in that force. And so uh, casting that in terms of an energy scale, you know, the energy scale for where we think quantum gravity effects would happen or something like 10 to the 19 uh, GeV. And so there's this, then you have the sort of known standard model uh, physics, which is at sort of the electroweak scale at the TeV scale, you have this huge, you know, 16 order of magnitude gap essentially in this energy where there's no known physics in between these two very big scales. Uh, from, from an experimental standpoint, that really, that really large scale of quantum gravity turns into a, uh, a very uh, feeble uh, force. So the, the, the smallness of the Newton constant relative to the other, uh, other interaction strengths in, in the standard model. And so, so to be able to test gravity in the lab really requires an extreme amount of experimental precision. Uh, so uh, for example, in our group, we're using these levitated uh, uh, silica, silica particles in, in, a, in a radiation pressure uh, levitation trap where we can get very low friction and measure forces that are, are very tiny at the level of 10 to the minus 21 Newtons, and and this is sort of what's required to to test uh, the Newtonian gravitational interaction between objects at the sort of length scale of, of tens of, of microns. Um, at the same time, uh, these experiments are particularly challenging, you know, because gravity is so small compared to the other standard model forces. All of the kind of electromagnetic background forces can can easily over overtake the strength of the gravitational signals that you're trying to, to measure. And so, for example, things like Casimir effects and uh, and other sort of electrostatic patch potentials and things like this can easily produce factors of a thousand or a hundred thousand or even greater times stronger interactions at these kind of short distances. Uh, it, where, where it makes it more challenging to, uh, to measure these uh, gravitational effects. Not only do you need the sensitivity, but you also need to be able to understand and, and otherwise subtract out these, these bigger background effects. And some of these uh, same considerations, you know, that, that apply to testing the inverse square law to check predictions of string theory or supersymmetry are also going to be relevant for uh, testing these other uh, ideas of being able to see whether the gravitational field, say, exerted by a, a system that's in a quantum superposition can actually uh, act on how it acts on another system, can it entangle another quantum system? And so we still have to contend with the same issues, the fact that, that the Newton constant is so small, that that gravitational uh, uh, interaction is so small, leading to very long time scales, while at the same time worrying about other kind of background effects from, from charges or electromagnetic backgrounds and that sort of thing. So, so it makes it uh, kind of doubly difficult to, to do these, these types of experiments. Okay, good, good. Andy, uh, so Sophia, maybe can you unshare the slide? Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay, so then um, I don't know who, who wants to who wants to, uh, to to talk about this to to comment uh, on this one. So so maybe to to maybe go. So so Andy basically very specifically talked about a specific type of experiments where you really have a large mass system levitated uh, or not, and then you you try to to generate uh, non classical states like. You know, is, is spatial superposition state of a mass being here and there, um, and and there are of course challenges uh, a lot. But maybe to take a step back and ask this question, is is that really the only experiment which we which we have to think about, which we maybe you know can do to test this interplay of of gravity and quantum mechanics? So is is the regime really that one where you you have to have like sufficiently large mass, but at the same time still be able to prepare a, a spatial superposition. So who, who, who wants to chip in here? There's Miles, yes, Miles, please. Actually, I want to echo your question because uh, Gary is here as well. I mean, one thing I've been wondering is that, you know, so Andy was talking about levitating silicon spheres, but we also have tethered mechanical oscillators for want of a better word that Gary works with. 
And then we've got the work of Marcus Arndt and, um, and say uh, Mark Kazovich, where you have atoms or molecules that are free and go through slits. So which, which I mean, which, which is, uh, is there a clear sense as to which of one of those is, is better for testing these, these um, gravitational effects? Um, I mean, I'm thinking of that isolation from the environment. Yeah, I mean, Gary, do you want to say some? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, this is also a little bit where, uh, where it's a bit tricky because how do we know how big it has to be? Uh, you know, to, to be able to see these gravitational effects. You know, it's a... Yeah, okay. I mean, th there, there are some models which, which predict, um, you know, these effects to come in. Um, I don't know, Angelo, do you, do you want to talk about some of these uh, ideas, some of these models which, which predict actually, you know, something to happen at a specific condition? You, you're, you're, un, uh, you're muted. You have to unmute. Okay. okay. Um, sorry. Uh, so that will not answer specifically the question of Myers, which, was, which is a technical question more for experimentalists, I, I, I think. But uh, coming to your question, yes. So, the, so if we take as a general framework the question, what happens to the superposition of two uh, masses, what happens to the gravitational field uh, when you have a superposition of two masses? So without entering into the details how to create and how to uh, measure that, then there are models that there are there is of course quantum theory that gives a, or at least a, a naive application let's say of gravity to, to quantum theory let's say they would say that an, a, in analogous way as uh, what happens with electromagnetism you should have the superposition of two gravitational fields you should have and then and then, and then the question is how to, to uh, how to measure that but there are also uh, different models which have been put, for, put forward for different reasons that say that perhaps uh, this is not what happens. The superposition of two masses does not generate a superposition of two gravitational fields. One example would be the Schrodinger-Newton equation, which has been uh, presented probably by Diyoshi the first time. I'm not really sure, but I think it was him in the 80s, late 80s, I would say. And uh, uh, that, but it has been also suggested by different people for different reasons, and it is a nonlinear. Uh, Schrodinger type of equation, which says that when you have the superposition of two masses, then the, these two terms of the superposition uh, attract uh, each other as if they were, so to say, two different, two different masses, not the superposition of one mass here and there, but just two independent half masses, half here and half there. And that basically would imply that if you have the superposition, then the two masses, sh these two masses should slowly recombine. There are papers in the literature that, uh, that uh, give uh, estimates, precise uh, 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 estimates of what you should do in order to test uh, this effect. And they, I probably, Andrew, if you remember this much better than me, but you have to go to the mesoscopic uh, scale. You, know, you have to scale the masses that are currently used in optomechanical experiments, but I don't know, four orders of magnitude. I'm just making up a number at that, that level. It's not 10, probably it's not one. So yeah. some, a few orders of magnitude that probably requires some technological advantage uh, development, which goes beyond the current state of the art. Or there are uh, the so-called, so this is a schrodinger newton equation, or there are the collapse models, spontaneous models of wave function collapse, uh, again, proposed by Diosio originally, then by Roger Penrose, uh, uh, by other people, Girardi, Perl, in uh, different ways, that claim that when you, that, that macroscopic superpositions are unstable, while microscopic superpositions are relatively stable, macroscopic superpositions are unstable, and the instability grows with the size uh, of the system. And then again, you have specific mathematical models, which give uh, specific uh, estimates of what kind of, kind of experiment you should uh, perform. And again, you are in the mesoscopic scale, masses that range from, I don't know, 10 to the 8, 9, 10, 11, depends on many things, depends on the size of the superposition, on the time scale, how long you can keep the superposition uh, isolated. But that's a, a, a deep uh, into the mesoscopic regime. So just to make a, uh, so, I mean, that, that means, so to say, that atom interferometry is not ideal in the sense. Atoms can be kept in a superposition for a long time, but they are very light. So you would have to wait quite a bit of time in order to see a decay of the superposition. And also the macromolecules of Marcus Arndt, that's of course, it's a way beyond atoms. It's, these are very challenging experiments, but still they are too light. So 10,000 atomic mass units is still not sufficient to perform a meaningful tests of uh, these ideas. So you should go uh, well beyond. Then there are non-interferometric tests, but I leave it to the later part of the discussion. Okay, thanks, Angelo. I, I see Yvette wants to say something. 
Yes, so you, you were asking that what other experiments could be reaching yes. um, scales where you could see the interplay of quantum mechanics and general relativity. So high mass is not necessarily the only way to go in that direction, just very high precision is one as well. And you can see it from atomic clocks like Dave Wineland had this beautiful experiment in which he had an atomic clock separated 33 centimeters and he showed time dilation. And now with the current accuracies, you can see time dilation within a centimeter. So when you have high quantum precision, you can also achieve those scales. So for example, I have some work in which you have a Bose-Einstein condensate in a box and then you have modes, collective modes of vibration of the atoms. The atoms collide and get entangled and you can prepare them in highly quantum states like squeeze states. And what my group has shown that changes in the space time due, for example, of pass of a gravitational wave or you know, the presence of, of some exotic field like a chameleon field or so on could um, produce changes in these phonons and you can uh, measure them. So that's another way that you could learn about quantum field theory and curved space time because you have that changes on the underlying space time could produce changes in quantum fields living that. And that is, of course, it's not the full theory, but it does give you some possibility of playing with effects at this uh, interface. Okay, good. Uh, thanks. So, so also Cheslav wants to say something, yeah? Yeah, Please. thanks. So I, I think it, it will be useful maybe to make this distinction between two types of phenomena that we are looking at the interference between quantum theory, general relativity. So the first type of phenomena are those in which we still can preserve the notion of a classical well-defined space-time, a fixed background, and that's what Yvette was just uh, telling us. And, uh, and it's surprisingly even that type of phenomena um, have been very uh, uh, sparsely or, or uh, uh, tested in experiments. So we really need more tests even on that part. The other type of phenomena are those where we expect some quantum feature of gravity where uh, the gravitational source is also quantum mechanical systems. For example, when we have a mass in the superposition and then we might ask ourselves what kind of phenomena we can expect there. And this is the one where Angel was talking about. And so I would like just to say that there was also, I think Gary asked, so what kind of uh, superposition we should create? Where should we expect new phenomena in this second part, uh, second type of, 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 of effects? And this depends on, on what you want maybe to test. Certainly there are, uh, parameter regimes where we can, where the collapse model predicts um, a breakdown of quantum mechanical superposition of that type. Um, and I think this is well investigated and we are approaching these parameter regimes. The other thing is what if these experiments have a negative outcome and we see that we still have, uh, that we don't have a collapse. What can we conclude from that? And that's a very interesting thing, I, I believe, that uh, we, can, we can, of course, um, maybe conclude that a superposition of large mass can preserve, but can we conclude out of this that the space-time itself was in some kind of superposition? This, is a, this, this step is not, non, is not trivial. And so if I have a mass in a superposition, and let's say this superposition survives, but you want to say that at the same time, when I have this mass in superposition, the space time around these two amplitudes is also in superposition. I don't think it's sufficient just to bring the mass back and see the interference of this mass. Uh, for the simple reason that when you bring this mass back, the space time around this mass you will bring back and everything will be very classical. You want something to say about the moment when this mass is in superposition. And one way I would say is to send in this space time some pro particles, or one pro particle. And this pro particle should feel then different space time as it travels neck close to the superposition. And eventually you should see entanglement. Entanglement will be some kind of source, uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, indication that the gravitational field were, was there in superposition. But can we go even beyond that? 
can we say the space time was in superposition? I think we will need more and more involved experiments. And one of them would be that the pro particle is an atomic clock. And then this atomic clock, all, all that this pro particle will be localized, will feel different time dilation depending how far it is from one or the other amplitude. So that you see that even the notion of time will get into some kind of superposition. And if we find out that this is for, uh, no matter how the clock is made of, is it universal time dilation? That will be, this is what we call then space time. If we have an effect that does depend on how we build up the clock, on which forces we build up the clock, then we say this is a feature of space time. And so for me, this will be kind of indication that we do have uh, a superposition of space time, but we are far away from from that. Yes, yeah, so that, that's what I wanted to say that that is looking, I mean, at, le at least from, from an experimental point of view, it, it, it's looking quite far ahead, but but maybe not, right, I, I guess. Um, so so what, what I maybe would say is that already, you know, what you explained at the beginning, if you, if you go for a quantum effect, and you can show that you can sustain the quantum superposition of a massive system, so it is not decohered by, by a gravitational effect. Then I would say that is already a very strong indication. It's of course no proof. We don't have a direct look at the physics which is going on there. What is the interaction really there? Uh, but it is an indication that you know gravity is somehow fine with this quantum superposition. So space time is fine to to sit in this in this superposition as as you know electromagnetism. Um, so okay, but you know I may be too conservative. So if if you push this forward, Shaslav. What, what is the experiment you 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 propose? So what is like the, the the ultimate experiment which already can also you know look into um, you know what is really going on with the space time, which is looking into the entanglement? Yeah, I think that the kind of experiments that I now describe is a kind of <laughs> ultimate experiment <laughs> in a, in effect. But of course. Uh, uh, one would need then to measure the mass and, and the pro particle in uh, different basises to prove that uh, this is really entanglement. Correlations just in one basis would not be enough. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we, one can think about even more uh, device independent kind of, of uh, proving this entanglement. But the fact that this entanglement between the internal degrees of freedom of our atomic clock, which would indicate the time, and the position of mass would, for me, indicate a strong indication would be for uh, preservance of coherence, even in the presence of superposition of masses. But since this seems to be a very hard experiment, maybe I, I'm finishing that, is there is uh, something what uh, Miles also worked on, and I mentioned in my introductory uh, uh, five, three minutes, is, is the quantum reference frames. So, uh, in, uh, we know that uh, uh, of Einstein equivalence principle, and this is something which people really test, and there are high precision measurements made on that. And the weak version of Einstein equivalence principles tells you, for example, that there is no difference between having experiments locally or in a static uh, uh, reference frame in the gravitational field or in one in which you have accelerated accelerant, uh, reference frame. This, when we talk about that, we always think about these reference frames being, um, being uh, classical reference frame attached to some classical objects. Uh, one can go beyond that and think that, oh, well, maybe we can think about reference frames being quantum mechanical. And then one maybe can extend ex uh, the validity of ancient equivalence, uh, weak equivalence principle to quantum reference frames. And now coming back to the experiment of before, then one could say that phenomena in the pre local, in the presence of a mass in a su superposition of two spatial positions are the same as the phenomena that we will see if we are in the reference frame, which is in a superposition of two accelerations. This is easier maybe to test. And okay. Miles has a very concrete um, proposal for that, and maybe he can comment. We have to, so we, we also have two other members. Now it's warming up who want to say something, but Miles, if you want to directly respond. 
is is that going into like you know analog systems where you yeah. you know mimic uh, gravity with acceleration uh, yeah. so you use the principle of equivalence uh, directly in that sense I explained it very clearly and well so i defer to angelo who i see his hand is up and maybe somebody else okay good so then uh, angelo you you wanted to say something and then gary yeah no, I just wanted to briefly comment. So I agree uh, with what uh, Chaslav said. Uh, just one point about the ultimate experiment for the quantum nature of gravity. That would be the test of the graviton, I would say. So it's an impossible experiment uh, at the moment. But if you really want to uh, prove that uh, space time is quantum, that waves are quantum, then you would uh, you have to go for the graviton. All the other experiments will uh, convince probably a large part of the community, me included. But uh, I don't know if high, ener high energy physicists would be uh, fully convinced that uh, entanglement experiments or time dilation experiments really test the quantum nature of gravity. I would be happy with that. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Angelo. Yeah, Gary. So uh, I wanted to follow up a little bit with what uh, Chaslav was just saying a minute ago, uh, because, you know, as someone trying to make a massive superposition, I like to think that if I if I create a massive superposition, then the gravitational field must be in a quantum superposition. And and also if I believe that gravitation has its origin in general relativity, then space time should be in a quantum superposition. Uh, so yeah, you know, the, yes, mm -hmm. I also sort of I also see his point though that there's not really that that, that the probe particle is a very different picture than letting it come back together. And 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 re cohere, let's say, uh, because. Uh, but then, if I take that a step further, I mean, even an electron in a quantum ground state is in a superposition of different positions, right? And therefore, also in principle, that is already, you know, even in a in a hydrogen atom, the space time is also in a quantum superposition. Is that, is that correct? Uh, and I mean, that's a little bit one of one of my problems as an experimentalist is how do I, you know, let's say, you know, if I'm working in quantum optics, you know, the, 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 there's like this Wigner function, you know, if I have negativity of my Wigner function, then I know, you know, if you know, my Wigner function is less than zero, then I know it's quantum, let's say, or if I'm doing a Bell test, there's a threshold, and I know I'm below the threshold, above the threshold, I know it's quantum. But yes. this one is a bit trickier, uh, because is there sort of like a Bell test number, or is there a a, a negativity of the Wigner function of the space-time superposition that I can uh, define that that we can shoot for for it as experimentalists. I I, I mean um, so the, again the the hands up. Um, so Yvette wants to say something. Yeah. Yes, sorry, I was muted. Yes, yeah, so so um, we're thinking about, okay, let's say what happens if we manage to see that superposition in the lab? What do we do next? Can we then conclude that the space time was as well in a superposition? And Chaslav is saying, well, we would then have to use a probe. Well, the thing is that if we're able to see a massive superposition in the lab, we don't have a theory to describe that situation yet. Right. So then when you think about how do we actually show that space time is like, well, we first have to, I think, refine our theories. But that's exactly where I want to go into that process, because if we're able to see that superposition, we will get some information directly from the experiment that will allow us to refine our theories. And then we will have to have some guide to come up with the first steps towards a theory that says what happens to space time. And with that new refined theory, we can think about new experiments, maybe like along of the lines that Chaslav is, is mentioning and so on. But you know, it's kind of very hard to propose further ex experiments when you don't have a theory. And it touches again on the point that Gary was making is that, okay, I want to create these superpositions, but I don't really have a full theory that gives me what parameters, what, how massive I have to get in order to, to claim that space time is in a, in a superposition. But I think the, 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 the story, the important answer is once we get to those experiments, we can start having this interplay between the experiment and the theory and move towards something more uh, meaningful. Okay, Miles. So, so I, I, it's a very interesting um, point that I, I don't quite agree, but of course that's, that's how we <laughs> make progress. So, so I, I mean, 
there's a paper by a series of papers by John Donohue, uh, where he he is able to show that um, you can make perfect sense of uh, um, uh, weak field uh, quantum gravity is a low energy effective field theory. And you can, you, I mean, he did calculations where he calculated the quantum gravity correction to the Newtonian um, uh, one over R uh, potential. Uh, and so I, 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 my, my belief is that that theory can be uh, adapted and generalized to the kinds of problems we've been discussing, situations, thought experiments we've been discussing, uh, Chaslav, yourself, um, and others. And it's just that we, we haven't done those calculations yet. And, and it's all, all kind of relying on the fact that we're only talking about low energy laboratory situations, not high energy um, effects. Uh, we don't need the full nonlinearity of, of quantum gravity um, or, or adjust the questions about, um, you know, what happens to time and space when we no longer have classical um, uh, or semi-classical um, observables. The, the one thing that I think really needs to be done in terms of extending his, his John Donahue's low energy effective field theory description is that we need to somehow include observables in the description, treating them quantum mechanically to have a fully gauge invariant theory. So I, I think progress can be made and there's a lot of work to be done. Can I reply quickly to that? Uh, Yvette, Yvette um, very quickly because- no, Very quickly. No, I think, I think my point is that yes, there are some theories made by people, but we haven't been able to test any of these theories in the experiment and, you know, falsify them or, or, or collaborate. So, so there are theories, but none of them have been proven in the experiment yet. I, but I think we're close. So I agree with what you say <laughs> in summary. Okay, um, Andy. Yeah, I just wanted to circle back around to some of the earlier discussion, the question that Miles brought up about, and also Gary about the size scale, the relevant, yes. and how big of a superposition do you need and this sort of thing. And I think, you know, the, it's true that the, the sensor, you know, we've had, we have really precise sensors like clocks and atomic interferometers and things like that. So, so uh, the, the, the requirements, uh, when you have a, a coupling that, that's proportional to mass, is it, it sort of uh, requires, um, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of material to produce a measurable signal because the, the Newton constant is so small going back to my earlier point from the beginning. So the, the, I think the, the one of the biggest challenges is to actually produce the source mass in some quantum superposition state. And so then the, the question is, you know, even if you had a, a, a you know, a, say an atom interferometer or you have a single atom that's separated by some very large scale, I mean, the, the gravitational field from one atom is, is not a very, not a very large quantity, right? But if you had a, a source that's a, a more macroscopic object, then you could, you know, imagine making a bigger, you know, space-time curvature or a bigger, a bigger uh, gravitational interaction. And so um, I was just going to point out there's some sort of length scale, you know, uh, where in several, we have, we have a paper out a few years ago, several of the co-authors are, are on the call here, actually, uh, in, the, in the audience as well, where the idea would be, you know, if you have kind of micron scale objects, uh, you can create uh, a pair of quantum superpositions that are separated by uh, length scales of order tens of microns. And in principle, uh, you have the sensitivity to measure the Newtonian potential uh, as, the, as the field which would be uh, responsible for entangling two quantum superpositions. So, so um, you know, there, it depends on, I guess, the, you know, the, the, it depends kind of, um, you know, which, which model, for example, you want to test. But so, so for sort of looking at sort of the conventional strength of where we expect the strength of normal gravity to be, that's sort of one, one thing that experimentally might be within reach in the next, uh, you know, 10-ish years or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, thanks, Andy. Um, so, Chaslav, you wanted to respond to one of the points. I just wanted to say that I agree with what Miles said, uh, but also with what Yvette said. We don't have a complete, of course, theory of that. And uh, but there, there is so linear quantum gravity. I guess this is what we were thinking about, where even the calculation within the linear quantum gravity have not been done, but even less than linear quantum gravity is that some of the arguments are based on, uh, on something like what we can say semi-classical gravity. And it, it's based on, on, on two principles, more or less, on which probably all more fundamental theories should agree in the limit. And this is that, first of all, that whenever we have a, a fixed ma mass distribution, the physicists as in general agree, just because this we have tested so far. And second, when we have a superposition, when we have a uh, this microscopically distinguishable mass distribution, 
like a mass left and nice right, they correspond to orthogonal quantum states. And this is also reasonable because something which is distinguishable in experiment, in microscopic even experiments should be assigned to orthogonal, almost orthogonal quantum states. And the third principle is the principle of superposition that we can superpose these two situations. This enough without having a more detailed description uh, would lead to kind of entanglement that I was proposing uh, uh, in, the, in, in the, this Kitankin experiment. What we do not describe is any fluctuations of this classical uh, mass distribution. Like if, if I think about the mass localized, well, quantum mechanics is never localized. So there is some kind of a distribution and fluctuations around that. This is what the future theory, quantum theory should describe. And we don't have, or we don't have an agreement on what, how to proceed with this. But for the experiments of the macroscopic superpositions, this is not necessary because distinguishability between these two states, mass left and mass right, is much larger than any fluctuation around one mass. Yeah, that was very clear. Thank, thanks, Cheslav. So, so, so maybe to, 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 to go back to, to Gary's idea with the electron. So, so my comment there would be that, um, of course, the, the effect to there, the, you know, the gravity effect, uh, but it is, 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 I would expect, very small, right? And it is, of course, uh, you know, much smaller than, for instance, the effect for which comes from the charge of the electron. And uh, as, as we know, when, 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 when we calculate the hydrogen atom, right? Or maybe I misunderstand what, what, you, what you have in mind. Well, I mean, I'm just wondering, like, as a, a, a fundamental principle, yeah. you know, can space-time be in a superposition? Yeah. If you want to ask that question, you don't need to compare it to electromagnetism or anything. You don't need to compare it to your resolution of your spectroscopy, yeah. of your spectrometer. You know, it seems that if an electron mass is in a quantum superposition in space, even in, in any state, then yes, we yeah, can for, sure, for sure. I mean, I, I would say yes, you're right. It should be. But then the next question, and that is, I think what what we what we discussed here, is uh, you know, can you use the electron in an experiment to really test this to prove that there is a superposition of space-time because of the mass of the electron. And my yeah. answer to that question would be much probably not because it is not the dominating effect. How can you, you know, if you generate yeah. a superposition of an electron, how can you ever prove experimentally that, you know, um, you know it, the effect of, of, of the mass of the superposition of the space-time is really there? And then the second question is also if, if, if the model would predict that for that small mass of the electron, um, you know, there should be um, an alternative maybe that it is not existing, right? So do we expect it to be at the space time in, in superposition of an electron? So Roger would say, yes, of course, it's such a small mass. There's no reason why we should think it cannot be, you know, a, a superposition of these two uh, versions of the space time. But if you increase the mass, if you make it like, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, a, a big ball, yeah. Then uh, you know it, it it decoheres very fast, so the superposition cannot exist. So that is what you know. Um, these kind of models, um, you know, contribute to that discussion. Yeah, um, that you can uh, you know estimate uh, scales uh, where you expect um, the gravitational collapse to happen. Okay, yeah, Yvette. I, I think maybe Yvette. Before that, let me check with Sophia. I, I don't know. I have lost track of time. Um, <laughs> not of space yet, but of time for sure. Um, so, so how are we doing? Should we should we at some point transition to the second question? And when would that be? Yes, so, uh, so we're quite keen to actually also bring in the audience questions. Um, so I think in the last um, um, hour, actually, so it's already an hour as so a time flies, um, and it's been a really great discussion. And we've actually um, touched a little bit on on both of those um, following questions. So I would suggest that we um, maybe go through those questions quite quite quickly, if that's okay with everyone. And then we open up in the last 15 minutes um, at quarter past um, for audience questions. Okay, so what, what you say is we, we go, go on for another eight minutes or so, and then we have some questions from the audience. Uh, yes, I would very, very quickly just touch on, on the two um, next questions that um, we okay. had in mind. Um, but some of those have already been raised and um, very good points um, by everyone. Um, so I'll just show the next question real quick. Uh, sorry about this, I just started again. 
Okay, so the second question we had um, is, and we have touched this uh, on this a little bit, what theoretical advances are needed in order to describe the interplay between quantum mechanics and gravity? Um, and here, if Kaslav would like to um, just give a few words. Yeah, I would can, I, can I just finish like what I was going to say before, because it was a bit connected to, to yes, that. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah that's just a good really, segue. Re really quickly, because I just realized that I was in a superposition of answers, because first I said we don't have a theory. And then I agreed with Miles that we you yes, we do have theories. And I think like Chaslav clarified, it's we have patches of theories. We have theories that apply in very specific uh, uh, scales and some theories that even contradict each other and things like that. So in that sense, we don't have a complete theory and they, they, they sort of um, um, need to be uh, tested in, in the experiment. So clarifying that first. But I wanted to point out because Chaslav was also saying that um, uh, we don't need certain things just to test the superposition of massive systems. And it goes to your question about what theoretical advances we need or we don't need because Chaslav was already pointing out at exactly the answer to that question. But I wanted to bring back into the table that what Roger Penrose actually said is that if you simply take the superposition principle and the equivalence principle to be valid to Together, what he shows is that they uh, come into a conflict. So he claims that you can't have them, you know, as part of the theory together, and therefore you see the collapse. So I, I guess these these whole things are very subtle. I think that's a really good point. And um, uh, yeah, Kasla, would you love to um, yeah continue so, on that thought? So yeah, the point is really subtle, and that's the, the role of the experimentalists to to decide. On that point, but uh, so I, I think we have really discussed uh, also this question. Maybe I just wrap up like uh, shortly. I, I mean, we have these two uh, type of phenomena: what one in which space-time can be considered to uh, be well-defined, and for that we have a well-developed theory. This is uh, quantum field theory, curved space-time. I think there is another type of phenomena where we expect that maybe the space-time also can be put in some non-classical state or, and there we have three different approaches, I would say. Uh, one is uh, something which we have discussed, this uh, various uh, collapse model, like the Oji Penrose model, which this superposition of, of that kind is uh, 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 predicted to collapse or not to exist. Um, um, and, and therefore, I think the experiments towards them is just to make a larger and larger superpositions and test uh, whether it collapses or not. Then there is a more kind of a approach towards really accepting that quantum gravity and space-time can be put in the superposition. These are more standard quantum gravity theories. Uh, yeah, we can think about the string theory or loop quantum. Uh, gravity and there I think we need something what already Miles mentioned before. I see a large gap between uh, theoretical models and uh, and the question which actions we should undertake in the laboratory to test them. Not because only uh, the expected uh, parameter regime is far beyond our uh, te technological capabilities, but more because these theories did not tell us what we have to do. It, what are the observables of these theories, Miles asked. So what should I do in the lab in order to test these theories is not clear. And finally, I would say there is uh, a very uh, scattered and random and slow process, I would say, of uh, people working on, I would say, maybe some kind of operational uh, uh, quantum gravity or, or uh, trying to really revise the necessary concept, like a concept of event. Is, is it something which is necessarily localized in space-time? What is an event? I think there is an attempt from various places, a perimeter here in Vienna, maybe Hong Kong, to really go in extremely slow operationally and uh, uh, close to uh, instrumentalism, if you want, but not in a bad sense of this word, to find out uh, how we should build up these theories, what it will even mean that the causal order is not well-defined or the metric is not well-defined and so on. And I think this doesn't have even a name and I personally think it's the most promising path towards this. 
Okay, thank you. I, I think that's that's a very broad view and lots of many yeah. good points. Um, and I think I think one of the things you mentioned in the beginning as well is um, that the fact that we we don't yet have any tests of um, quantum field theory in cursed space time. And I was wondering if maybe Yvette would like to um, say a few words on that one. Um, yeah, so uh, quantum field theory has been tested many times, I mean, in CERN and, and, and so on, but the curve case when you have gravity hasn't been tested yet. And we have the idea that the effects are very small in order to be um, to possibly test them in, in the experiment. And that's why people have focused a lot on analog models. However, um, using the, the sort of system I mentioned before, in which you have um, atoms trapped in a, in a box, so they're uh, colliding what you get there are phononic modes. So these are a relativistic quantum field. And, and then by mm, looking at some changes in space time, so it doesn't need to be a gravitational wave. For example, you could put a little mass close to the BC. So this is something that I did with Dennis Ratzel. You can move the, the mass a little bit and that would create observable effects in the relativistic quantum field in the box. That would be, uh, for example, first steps towards the demonstration of, of the theory. And I think this would be very interesting because famous predictions of quantum field theory in curved space time are Hawking radiation or particle creation by the expanding universe, which are obviously very difficult to test. But I don't think we have to limit ourselves just to analog experiments. I think we can test real space time effects using um, uh, this sort of systems. Okay, I think that, that sounds like a really promising um, way forwards. Um, so in the, in the interest of time, um, I was wondering, if, would anyone else like to comment on the theoretical advances um, that we might need in order to test these effects in the laboratory? Okay, so I think that was a really good wrap up um, by Chesla as well. Thank you so much. Um, and then we will go to the third question that we had, which we also have touched a little bit of, uh, upon, but maybe some more concrete words can be uh, said here. So let me very quickly share my screen again. And um, the third question we had um, was what parameter regimes are the most interesting ones for these experiments? And here, Hendrik, if you'd like to moderate uh, this question a little bit. I, I can, yeah. Um, so, uh, actually, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, and I'm still in my mind a little bit in, in, in the previous discussion, and I think there's, there's, there's maybe one question which maybe also has has been asked, um, you know, quite, quite um, a lot of times. And that is, um, you know, more about our expectations. Yeah. Um, 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 when, when it comes to gravity, so so what are, is actually the reason that we think that also gravity fundamentally um, should be quantum? Or, and and is there is there indication um, that uh, that that is 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 the case? So I uh, I, I maybe just throw this question in, into the round and. Um, um, ask if any of, of the panel uh, members want to maybe say something about this. Um, I, I think that that is uh, it's it's certainly a question I'm very much uh, interested uh, in, and I, I ask myself that 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 question. Um, I guess if you if you look at um, gravity as a force, like in the old way, and you think, okay, we have four uh, forces in nature, and you can quantize the other three you know, the electromagnetic, the weak and the force, then if gravity is the fourth, you know, force, then why not? I guess that would be like the first naive guess we should quantize it as well. However, you know, uh, what uh, Einstein taught us is that um, uh, gravity is a very different uh, thing when he introduced the notion of space time. So I think it becomes very unclear if there is a strong reason why we think it should be quantized or, you know, I don't think we have an answer to that. Hmm. Yeah, of course. I mean, that that is that's always the starting point in in the discussion. Um, but then it, it it is not very successful so far, right? I mean, we we are still struggling in 
um, you know, doing the same thing with, with gravity, uh, you know, what, what we did with the other forces. So um, it for sure is, is different. Um, so, so to ask the question the other way around, so, so maybe gravity is classical uh, fundamentally, could, could that be, or would that be a, a completely weird thing which we, which we don't uh, somehow think it, it could be, yeah? Um, Does somebody else want to? I, I, yeah. I think, let I try to comment on that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think the problems with quantum of gravity are so long-standing, so persistent, that they're likely not to be only of technical nature. Mm -hmm. but rather a conceptual one. And I think we simply have not learned how to think about quantized space-time, which is different than some having a field on a fixed space-time, because the notion of the, you know, if we have a well-defined space-time, the things are happening in the space-time, and then we can have also quantum fields on this space-time. But here the thing is not of that kind. It's much more subtle because, because also the space time and the location uh, of the events is, uh, uh, are not referred to this fixed background, but to something which is also quantum nature. And I think that's what gave me a hope that there is a way to to quantize gravity, but we haven't learned yet how to do it. Mm -hmm. It's not that there is, we cannot, I mean, we have a lack of imagination a little bit. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I always also, feel like it's the opposite for me. I can, uh, you know, accept easily, you know, lots of stuff. <laughs> and and no, then no. There, is, there is maybe, and I'm finishing, there's no tool. Of course, there are more about it, some intuitive appeal. Like, first of all, it's the quantum theories are very robust. That's what I have learned working on reconstruction of quantum theory. If you, you cannot tweak a little bit some features of quantum theory mm. uh, and then hope to get something different, it collapses everything. It's, it's really an Iceland in the theory. It's very hard to combine the interaction between classical, uh, between quantum and non quantum uh, uh, systems. So, a coherent theory in which one element will not be quantum. It's very hard to build up. I think it's not impossible, but it's very hard. And I think Angel also mentioned about possibility of having signaling in some theories if you combine that and so on and so on. And, and the third and the last point, which is really more emotional one. I never thought that you can make a progress in physics by going back to the concepts of in historical concepts. So I don't think we will make a progress by going back to the pre-quantum notions mm. or fixed, back, fixed background, or, or just like in quantum theory, I don't think you will make progress in understanding by going back to the notion of a classical trajectory. So probably that's what we expect in future will be much even, even to a higher degree weird than quantum theory itself. And that's why it's hard. Mm. I, I, I like that point very much. Yeah, that, that is, that's a good one. Um, uh, Angelo has his hand up. So Angelo, you want to say something? Yes. So again, I almost completely agree with Chaslav, and now I'm getting disappointed that I keep agreeing with him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, of course. No, I agree that the combination of... Uh, I agree with him when uh, that combination of uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity will uh, much likely require a complete revision of our understanding of nature and basically it's based on a, some sort of lack of imagination or whatever. And that it's not just quantizing gravity in a simple terms, but I'm not sure. Uh, and also I, I, would, I would stress the fact that not quantizing something doesn't mean to keep it classical. The path could be something different, something that we don't understand at the moment. So uh, apart from this, I'm not sure whether uh, trying to find the right way of quantizing gravity might be at all the, the, the proper thing to do. It could be that the theory uh, that we, we should look for has nothing to do with uh, quantum as much as quantum theory is different from uh, classical physics. So, of course, if one keeps it, calls quantum everything that is not classical, then it will be a quantum theory of gravity. 
But if quantum physics means uh, Hilbert space, superposition, linearity, these kind of things, it's not clear at all why they should, uh, the, the future theory sh should have any resemblance with quantum, uh, with, uh, quantum mechanics. And also, again, something that Chaslow said is correct, uh, combining quantum theory with something that is not quantum and typically classical is very difficult, uh, difficult and typically you run into contradictions. And at the end of the day, there are only a few things you can do in, in, a, in, a, in, in some way or another. But that, that could be an indication that you really have to revise the notion of quantum theory and come up with a new theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So, so um, I think that's a good point to maybe um, you know, uh, close the discussion on the, on, on the conceptual theory side. Uh, but I know that Gary had prepared something about uh, the parameter space for the experiment. So um, these things are going on simultaneously. So and uh, as this discussion is about how can we test this, how can we do experiments? So um, I don't know, Gary, if you want to say some some summarizing words or, or on your opinion about what what you think is um, the right parameter space to 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 look experimentally for. Um, uh, for effects of, of gravity and quantum. So that, that's, that's tricky. <laughs> I, <think it's laughs> I know. <the> <laughs> um, so we haven't really touched in detail on, on, on how the different detailed theories uh, predict a time scale. In fact, uh, that, that's very tricky. Uh, so I don't, I mean, we can have that discussion, but I think it's maybe better to open that up uh, mm -hmm. To, to a broader context maybe, uh, and let other people in the, in the audience contribute. I mean, some, one of the things that I think I will take away from this is also, I mean, you know, it's very difficult for me as an experimentalist to say when I think I've made space-time in a quantum superposition. <laughs> uh, so, and, and, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure what, you know, I, I'm still looking for uh, for for the the smoking gun on that one actually, and I think uh, maybe maybe we need to indeed observe gravitons and look for quantum fluctuations of of, of clock uh, times in observer particles or something. I I'm not sure where to go with that actually. That's an interesting one. Okay, but um, I mean also also being an experimentalist, I think um, you know one one idea which popped up many times in the discussion here is that it seems to be at least one thinkable uh, way to test this is to, to generate a, a quantum superposition, which is, which is very massive. So where you really have like a big mass and where you say now gravity should play a role for, for this quantum yeah. superposition, right? So I, I agree to that to a certain degree, but I mean, I mean, big mass is again, big compared to what, right? I mean, that's, that's a big, the, the problem with an experiment is I have to, oh, I can't just say big. I say big compared to what? And then should it be big? Should it be, should I displace it by a small enough amount that the, or a small amounts that the nuclear mass distribution comes out of each other and I have this, this Penrose energy, uh, you know, which, which gives me a time scale or should I displace the entire thing out of it? Does it have to be 10 microns apart? Like, like what Andrew yeah, I, I was guess, I mean, again, again, uh, you know, as an experimentalist to, to, you know, improvise on non-existing, uh, you know, theory and to, um, I, I would, I would compare it to the physics we know, right. Which, which maybe is, is already a mistake or not, 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 not good. But when it comes to gravity, I, I would use Newton's law to estimate and that, you know, goes also back what Andy mentioned. So when you, when you come up and you, you predict an experiment and you say, now, when do I expect? That, yeah. You know, yeah, that but the even, even though there's ambiguity in how you apply Newton's law, I mean, uh, you know, but th 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 this is now getting into discussions of the interpretation of these parameters that we haven't really gone into much yet uh, yeah. in this discussion. Okay, so I, I see that, uh, you know, it, it's maybe something we can come back to if, if people from the audience uh, ask questions. Um, but I think, you know, time-wise, uh, Sophia, uh, I think we, yes. we, we should so, in, in involve people out there in, into the discussion. Absolutely. Um, so so, so actually... maybe let me, let me think, the, you know, the panel members at this point, uh, for this discussion and I, I found like really interesting to to discuss this even though it may seem that we have gone nowhere <laughs> and there are many ideas and there was maybe like also a, a confusing structure to this discussion uh, which would be entirely my fault but uh, I, I enjoyed it a lot and I think it was we have heard very interesting uh, comments and uh, uh, my, my feeling is we are getting there so at some point we will come up with, with, an, with a great idea 
how to you know test it and how to actually prove that um, you know there is a gravity effect in these quantum systems. Okay, thanks. So I hand over to Sophie to uh, engage with um, everyone out there. Absolutely. So thank you, Hendrik, and, and I echo that, that this was a really interesting discussion and I have, would have been very impressed if we had solved some quantum gravity questions in, in this hour. Um, but it, it was really, really nice. So thank you, everyone. Um, and I'd like to open it up to for everyone who's listening on, on YouTube and also here on Zoom to ask questions. Um, so please raise your hand if you want to do so. Uh, and I'd like to start um, uh, just very quickly because we had an early question. Sorry um, for, for those who just raised their hands. We had a really early question on YouTube at the beginning of the talk, which relates actually to something um, that Gary said about clocks. Um, so the question is, um, and I will put it in the chat as well, um, to, to try and do the questions in some kind of chronological order. Um, we had the question reads, what about the recently reported experiment in Australia, Vaccaro and Street looking at atomic clock time fluctuations close to a nuclear reactor? So I was wondering if someone, any of the panelists is familiar with this experiment and can comment on it. So sure. maybe that is not the case then. Um, Maybe Gary, do you think this is somewhat related to the clock um, um, experiments? I'd have to look up the experiment. It's a very interesting one. I should Google it, <laughs> but I don't know it offhand, so it's hard for me to, to say. Okay, so thank you very much for the question on YouTube. Um, so I see a hand raised by Sagata, and I think Roger also you raised your hand in your in in the camera. Um, would would you would I don't know who was first. I think I saw Roger first. Roger, so would... Roger, Roger, Roger was first. Roger, okay, Roger. please, Roger, go ahead. Well, I want really to uh, raise an issue, a different way of looking at this. It's not so much a question. Um, I don't know whether you can see this. This is a, a cartoon, really, where we have quantum mechanics on one side and general relativity on the other, and they both have their problems. And often people trying to do quantum gravity can concentrate on the problems of general relativity. That is, we have singularities in black holes and you have very general theorems to tell you that you're going to have singularities. That is more or less to say that the space-time curvatures get so big that you can't treat them classically and people say, oh, well, it's quantum gravity. Now, the trouble with quantum gravity to try and deal with the singularities is it's not the answer. And it's not the answer because it's the singularities we get in the future are completely different from the Big Bang. And so, although this could be of great relevance to general relativity to, to apply quantum mechanics, I mean, people really say, get rid of the singularities in the black holes and all that, and that's a quantum gravity problem. But it address, you might say, well, what about the Big Bang singularity? And since these singularities are so completely different, if you like the Big Bang singularity has very, very low entropy, more, where another way of putting it is the vial curvature is probably zero. Whereas in the remote future, you get singularities with very, very high entropy, and there the vial curvature goes simply wild. So it seems to me that there is a, a problem with trying to, as, as far as we understand things, to try and get rid of the problems of general relativity using quantum mechanics. Now, what about the problems of quantum mechanics? Now, the main problem of quantum mechanics, well, there are all sorts of divergences and things like that. But as far as I can see, the main problem is the measurement problem. So here I have a cartoon with a cat which is half dead and half alive. So don't pay too much attention to that. I'm just saying that it is the measurement problem. Roger, can you put the, 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 the picture up? Because we yes. couldn't see all of it. It looks uh, very nice. Up more? Oh, yeah. Okay. No picture? Yeah, thanks. These at the top are the main things because it's got the cat, the cat here. Put it the right way around. Half dead and half alive cat and singularities. And I'm trying to say that we don't at the present have a way of handling the singularities in general relativity by quantum mechanics. And there is this fundamental issue that the ones in the future are so different from the one in the past. So that I used to think that meant quantum gravity is a, is a very, very strange uh, asymmetric, time asymmetric theory. I don't think that is the resolution, but I don't want to go into that here. On the other hand, the measurement problem there are arguments which have been alluded to slightly in this discussion. Uh, I don't hope you can see this. I'll just describe it mainly. If you, this is a question about whether the principle of equivalence and the principle of, of quantum superposition are inconsistent. 
And the argument there is a fundamental inconsistency. And the thing is that, okay, think of a tabletop experiment and you want to take into consideration the Earth's gravitational field, which we'll regard as a constant for the moment. Then you say the Newtonian way would be to look at that and say that you have a, a term in the Hamiltonian which corresponds to the Earth's field and you just go proceed like that. No problem. What about the Einsteinian way of looking at it? Well, you say, no, you should think of this as, a, as an acceleration. You're, you're having your lab is, is accelerating. And so you're looking at an accelerating frame. And then you do your calculation without a gravitational field, but you put in the fact that you've got an acceleration frame. And you find the answers are subtly different. They're almost exactly the same, except for a phase factor. And this phase factor is, you might think, is, well, who cares about a phase factor? The main problem is that it depends on the time in a way which involves the cube of the time. You have an exponential of a uh, of time cube times the something time involving the dis difference in gravitational fields locally. So if you have a super if you have a superposition between two masses, suppose in your experiment you have a superposition between two masses. I hope that can be seen here. I don't know exactly what can be seen on the screen. And here I have two masses, and you try to treat them in the Einsteinian way, then you've got a different vacuum for this. And if they're in superposition, then you're in trouble because you can't you know, change your vacuum and, and maintain superpositions. It just doesn't work. So the problem, the, the resolution after a fashion, which I adopt is to say, well, this is an indication of a problem. And this problem can be, you integrate it over space. And then you say, this problem is basically uh, <clears throat> a, an uncertainty in the total energy of the system. And then you use the time energy, Heisenberg time energy un uh, uncertainty principle, which says that the Uncertainty in the energy is reciprocally related to a, <clears throat> an uncertainty in the time, or it gives you a, a time scale for a, uh, or for, for this, for the, if you have a superposition, the time scale for that to persist. So I'm not saying that the superpositions can't exist quantum mechanically, it's just they have a lifetime. And then I have, I have arguments to try and show that this is a problem. <laughs> with relativity. I don't want to go into these arguments here, but, but I just want to say that if you have time going up here, then you've got a mass which is put into a superposition of two locations. Can you see that? And then if one of them disappears because it, the lifetime is limited, and then it becomes the other one, you can't do this relativistically, unless you say it goes right back to the origin. So here's the picture I have of what's going on with a superposition. I hope you can see this picture. I don't know if the whole thing is in the screen. Let me start, start at the bottom, where here we have a, a laser which fires a high energy photon into a mass uh, through a beam splitter. So that half the photon hits the mass and starts to move it. The other half goes off the picture. Then you follow the history of this. The mass is now in a superposition of two locations. And as this superposition comes greater and greater, you come to this time scale I don't think I said explicitly what that is. It's the, when the gravitational self energy of the difference between the two mass distributions. And you have to do this in a Newtonian picture, otherwise um, I don't know how to do it, but you can at least estimate it that way. And you say that the, the mass going this way minus the mass distribution of mass going that way. And you take the gravitational self energy of that and that is a, an uncertainty in the energy of the system. And the, the reciprocal of that gives you the lifetime of the system. And so then what happens? Well, one of these dies and the other one survives. But the point of view that I think you have to have, because in this previous picture, you have a problem with relativity, unless the superposition really, you lose one of the space times right down here, when the difference between them is very small. And even though the reduction means one of them disappears here, you have to say that you forget that history and the history of the universe was the other one. So it's a bit like what Yvette was saying that you in effect don't have a superposition between space times, but it doesn't resolve it as being one or the other until later. It looks almost like a contradiction in this picture, but I can't see how to make it into a contradiction. I think it's a perfectly consistent picture of what happens. It's not a theory, but I think there are re reasons for something like this having to be 
what goes on. So I think it does relate to some of the issues that came up in the discussion, but uh, it, it's, it's the picture that I have. It also suggests that such as these experiments down the, down the well or down in the deep mine when you try to see that you don't get heating, uh, and the thing called the Dioshi Penrose looks as though it's in trouble from this model. That's not my model, because that would be a model in which you look at the, the both things existing up here, and so you get a heating. But if you take this retroactive perspective that one of them disappears, and then you go back to when there was very little displacement between the two alternatives, and so you don't get any heating. So I think um, we thank you so much for, for that. I mean, we actually have another comment on YouTube on um, yeah. the experiments that you mentioned, which is this really exciting underground experiments. And the question reads, could Angela Bassi comment on the recent underground tests of gravity related wave function collapse experiments which is carried out in Italy? Um, and Angela, I know, I know that Angela has to leave as well um, uh, very shortly. So I was wondering if you'd like to give a few words um, in, in, in comment to what Roger said and also to answer this question. Um, okay, so well, of course, I mean, I fully support the, the idea that there is a measurement problem in quantum mechanics, as Roger was saying, and also as, well, as it came up uh, earlier, and so that there is a trouble with the, with the linearity of quantum theory when it's extended to the macroscopic domain. And one of the solutions is to sort of assume that the, the world is ultimately nonlinear. Also, a possible quantum or modif slightly modified quantum world is nonlinear, and superpositions do not propagate from the micro to the macro world. That would be a way out from the measurement problem. Regarding the experiments, these are indirect tests of, uh, of the mo collapse models, models that uh, have a dynamical equation implementing the collapse of the wave function. The collapse has to be random because we do not know where the wave function collapses, so there must be some sort of randomness. And of course, there is a, a it could be a discussion of what is the source of that randomness. That's a, that is a different story. And uh, so in, in all the models that uh, dynamical equations have been uh, developed so far, there is uh, this uh, uh, Brownian motion induced by the, uh, by the collapse. And there are also theoretical reasons why you somehow you need that in order to avoid superluminal signaling in these models. And this is what uh, the experiment tested. The experiment tested indirectly the, this side effect of, uh, of, of this equation implementing the collapse of the wave function, even if the wave function is describes an object that is localized. So it's conceptually is nothing more than that. Looking for this uh, uh, Brownian motion, this diffusion, and try to bound it. Then, of course, the difficulty is uh, to model theoretically the specific situation, then to do the experiment. That was the challenge from both the theory and the experimental side. Yes. Well, at least there's a theory you can test there. You see, the, what I'm yes. saying is very hard to test. I agree. Yes. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much for that comment. Um, Sugato, you've had your hand up for, for a long time. No, no. Yeah, so so let me first thank uh, everyone. It was really good to hear a lot of viewpoints and, and a lot of uh, you know interesting ideas there. So I, I just wanted to emphasize a point which has actually, you know, I think Aslav uh, are, are, um, alluded to that. And also I think others uh, have, have uh, you know, Andy Miles uh, mentioned it. So in in some sense, uh, I don't think that the one mass, uh, you know, superposition will go all the way. Okay, so it may w well be that uh, you know gravity is classical at some stage, or, or becoming from quantum to classical, you know, in, in, as in uh, Rogers model or collapse models. In that case, of course, as we know, one mass superposition is is uh, is already going to give you interesting information. But uh, you you see, I mean, you want to know whether gravity itself was in a superposition. So, so in somehow you have to involve another probe as, as Kasla was also telling. And, and then the question arises that, I mean, if you are able to create one superposition, right? Hold it coherent for a while, okay? And, and you are also having a probe means, means it's a good probe, like it's probing gravity as opposed to EM. Then there's not much point in having these two things different, right? So if you are, I mean, since gravity depends on m r square, m square, if you have, if you can create, you know, one superposition, hold it for that time and, and, and do something, then you might as well probe its gravity through, you know, another, you know, identical thing. And here, 
the thing is that since quantum means coherence, you know, as as uh, Kasla was emphasizing, so I, I don't think there's any any lesser experiment than trying to, uh, you know, to if you if you are to really uh, you know uh, evidence quantum that, than to entangle uh, you know to such uh, masses. So this is this is kind of I'm, I'm saying this is the least one can do to. Uh, verify the you know the quantum coherent nature there a anything less would be a test of a you know a classical stochastic theory or it would of course test um, you know if there are modifications of quantum mechanics and but they would be on the way anyway right and they would be tested earlier so yeah so this is one of the things and i i wanted to make a quick comment on uh, gary's uh, comment um, regarding what mass scale what what would suffice so we know one regime but from that one has to probably extrapolate up and down so we know a regime which you know andy mentioned so if you have kind of uh, 10 to the power minus 14 kg which is like microspheres and if you make kind of 10 micron superpositions then you can really find, uh, you know, uh, a gravitational uh, effect, okay, uh, for such a superposition. Now, of course, if you have, uh, and but that requires still holding that superposition for one second, one full second, which is a very long time, right? So you can reduce this second by this m square effect. You can go to a larger mass to try to get a smaller time, right? Uh, so that that's that's then the, the trade off one can try to play, but but of course larger mass again means uh, you know you have to uh, prepare uh, a larger mass in a superposition and hold it. So so that's so you can just extra you know uh, extrapolate or underpolate the effect. Uh, uh, however, it is good to really have nothing uh, holding it, uh, which is why uh, we kind of. Uh, collaborated in our uh, things with, with mostly people who let things go but I mean of course it's possible you know other I, I'm, I'm not telling that deter things would not be working and and also there's this uh, events uh, systems where uh, it, it might be possible to kind of um, you know uh, make some kind of hub, hybrid where where we use the, the the cooling ability and things of the the atoms and and then we try to you know uh, do the superposition with a larger object, uh, something uh, like sympathetic coolings. Maybe Andy can comment on that. So that's that's anyway. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Sugata. Um, uh, Andy, would you like to give a quick comment on that? No, I think I think Sugata kind of summarized a lot of possibilities pretty well. I'm I'm not sure I would, um, uh, you know, add too much to what he what he said. I think you know the the. One of the challenges, of course, is making a big mass in a superposition, right? And then um, I think he, you know, if you have a if you have an effect that's coupled to mass, you of course want to make your sensor massive as well. But um, but you can also, uh, in principle, take advantage of other highly sensitive probes, right? Uh, for example, clocks or interferometers or other techniques, uh, which uh, you know is I think it's interesting to explore. And you know, it's, it's also possible that there's some other tethered systems that that you know look promising in some range of parameters, uh, but, but uh, um, yeah, so I, I don't have any specific, uh, um, um, too, too much more to add to what, what Sagato said. Thank you. Um, I think Yvette, was that a hand raise in response to that? Yes, I was <laughs> just going to say, you know, that um, if you want to take steps towards learning from the experiment things, the first thing to do would be just to try to get this one massive superposition. And then comes now the question is the space time also in a superposition, but uh, if it collapses is Roger is right and it collapses, then you will never see entanglement between two no so I think the the experimental path is kind of clear please first check if you don't get collapse or if you do, and then, for example, if you did get, see collapse, you still might get entanglement, but at different scales at different mass scales and at different time scales. So a bit touching about what Gary was saying, where do I know where my scales are? Well, that depends you, 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 when, when you do see, if you did see collapse, then you would know uh, that uh, looking at the effect that Sugato um, 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 uh, put forward with the entanglement, you would have to go to much more challenging scales. However, if we did manage to hold superpositions of massive systems, then the next experiment definitely should be to put two and, and entangle and go on. 
Thank you so much for that comment. Um, so just quickly, I'm not thinking we, we are actually nearing um, 4 p.m. in the UK now. Um, so I'd like to, if some of the panel members can stay behind just a few more minutes, um, we'll go through the next questions, but I know some have to leave. So I'd like to thank um, uh, you all once more. Thank you so much for, for coming to this event. And we put a survey in the chat um, and we're trying to always improve these talks. So if you have anything that you'd like to share with us, um, please fill out a super quick survey and let us know. Um, okay, so so thank you all very much. Um, and let me try and remember who was next. I think Munich, um, it was uh, the one with the hand raised uh, next. Uh, okay, um, so thank you very much uh, for all your, all your talks and uh, discussions. I, uh, I learned a lot. Chaslav, you mentioned about the uh, the, uh, uh, the the operational approach to uh, to general relativity uh, in order to see how the quantum mechanics and general relativity can uh, somehow work together. But if 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 that is the case, so did you when you said operational approach? Is it like the uh, the uh, the the clocks uh, you 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 had in in your paper? For for example, it, yeah, I wasn't quite sure what you meant by operational theory. And another thing is that if if you do that, then will we be able to have a unique uh, way to describe operationally the, the general relativity. Okay, so what I mean with this is, uh, is it includes what you have said, but it's not sufficient. So mm -hmm. I would say first is uh, we, we can even ask very fundamental question, what is time? Okay, so and I would say one approach, which would be operational one, a t time is what the clock shows. Mm -hmm. okay, so, so when I talk about that, uh, the, about the entanglement between the probe at atomic clock and a mass in a superposition, and I say that what clock shows the, the pointer of the clock that uh, or, uh, uh, is entangled with the position of the mass, then I would say, well, it's more than that. The time is not well defined, and the time uh, is entangled with the position of mass. And then I would exclude that this is any other uh, uh, feature because I use different clocks, maybe one which is based on nuclear force and then one on electromagnetic force. And I see that all of them get entangled mm -hmm. with the mass. And I would say, well, then no matter how I measure time, of course, one can deny this and say, well, if you have a deeper ontological meaning of time, which is independent of how we measure. I think this is an interesting option, but I would not know how to approach and test this option experimentally. And that's why I would not take this approach. But I would say that operational general relativity is more than because this is already rod and clocks as a, as a instrument of measuring space time, something what was already in GR in Einstein's original formulation. What I mean with this is that we as an agent can influence space time. Mm. For example, like have a Duncan experiment in which I have a laboratory with very large spheres, massive spheres. Mm. And then I can send these spheres to other regions of space such that depending on my action, I can influence the space-time features in my light, uh, future light cone. So I can even influence um, causal order between two laboratories that are in open future to me. So that means that I have an active uh, uh, preparation, if you want, and then of course the measurement of the features of space time. Just like I can prepare any state in my laboratory, in quantum laboratory. Now, this would be something along towards operational classical generality. 
now I can put these masses in a quantum superposition and, sure. and choose to send them in the different ways. Okay. Yeah, but uh, will it then be able to uh, the uniquely describe some concepts in general relativity or will there be more than? I didn't understand your so, can you repeat the question? Yeah, for instance, time or whatever the uh, the concept in general relativity. If I have just operational approach, will there be just one operational approach for one thing, or will there be? Yeah, that's my question. I uh, I don't know, but I think we will soon agree where, because it's so close to our what we do in the lab that when we do that and this produce, we will agree on, on the procedure and the relation between the concepts in the theory with our action in the laboratory. So I do hope that we will agree on that. Okay. This is also in quantum mechanics, there are disagreement of interpretation, but on operational level, we all agree what it is. Okay, right. thank you very much. Thank you, Minchik. Thank you for the question. Thank you. We have, um, so we will very soon wrap it up, but we have one last question from uh, Modassos, one of the organizers. And um, so the question reads, one major approach thus far has been to try and create larger quantum mechanical states. But we have very little control over gravity, for example, to generate gravity. So having control over that would enable uh, uh, to have control over the interaction as well. Um, does the panel have any ideas of a different approach um, to this that doesn't necessarily rely on large quantum mechanical states? Um, I can also put the questions in, in the chat so you can read it. So the question is whether to, to have control over gravity, is there another route um, other than big masses? I, I don't know what if any want to wants to, anybody wants to comment this. This is a this is a very very interesting question. I mean, I have some thoughts about that, but I would like to hear maybe other people maybe experimental. I, I guess it depends on what you have to test as well, right? I mean, is he just talking about um, the the space time being in a superposition of two? I, I'm not sure I understood the full question. Um, so I guess the, the question is uh, related to if we want to study the, the interaction of gravity in a quantum mechanical context, um, we can either do this with, with large masses or is there some other way? So I think, um, Mudassar, unless you'd like to um, um, elaborate on the question yourself and not just have my interpretation. Thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll try to elaborate a bit. Um, so I guess I was thinking about whether uh, it is advantageous to try and generate gravity in the first instance in some way, and if that's possible at all. Um, so this goes back to an, a, a comment I remember reading about LIGO, for example, the fact that it can detect gravity, gravitational waves. Um, so here I'm not talking about quantum gravity. I'm just talking about gravitational waves, let's say, or just classical gravity that it can detect it, and in principle, it should be generating it as well. I don't know um, what you have in mind, it would be more like if you want to simulate things. And I, I find that always a bit problematic because mm. when people come up with the idea of an analog or a simulation of something, you're sort of taking, uh, for example, a system like a bunch of atoms to behave as in a black hole. So you're forcing that mathematical theory on the, on the system. And then if you see deviations from that, it could be just because you actually don't have a black hole. So it's very difficult to make real statements on the theory you want to test with a simulation. So I think there's like dangerous in that sense. And also you can simulate anything on a computer. Well, not anything, but you know what I mean. You can mm -hmm. simulate something also in an analog system, like a really funky chameleon field, but that doesn't mean that that exists out there in nature. So in a simulation, you can't really falsify any theory. So I would always prefer to go for trying to uh, do the experiment with real gravity than to simulate it with electric fields or something like this, because you always end up in very dangerous lands, I would say. Yeah, no, no, I, I completely agree with you. And I guess my question was with real gravity. So, I mean, one thing I can think of off the top of my head, and I know the numbers come out very short, 
Um, but if you have a rotating rigid rotor that's of, of a massive nature, you know, if this thing is rotating extremely fast, it's going to be generating, in principle, a gravitational wave. Um, of course, the numbers are extremely small, but um, maybe we have to be experimentally imaginative. Um, maybe there's lots and lots of rigid rotors rotating in an array, maybe, I don't know, that well, we, we some sort some of amplification work. or something. Uh, but. We, we have some work that I mentioned before uh, in which we take uh, both Einstein condensate, so you, the phonons are a relativistic quantum field, and then you take a nanoparticle, like the ones that people have been talking about, but using it for the self-energy. But in this case, you can move that nanoparticle, you can make it vibrate, and what it will make is create some sort of, uh, well, it's not a gravitational wave in the sense of a merge, but it's a space-time distortion that's sinusoidal, and that would affect the, the phonons. So that mm. would be uh, a way of, of, of testing like a real gravitational effect that you can produce in, in the lab in principle. Okay. Oh, thank you. I think we have a quick comment from Chaslav as well, and I'm, I'm tempted to make this the last comment because I know we're, we're um, you know, heading towards 4 p.m. So please, Chaslav. Yeah, so I, I, I find this question very intriguing. Uh, we all talk about this prime example of a double slit, so to say, a mass in a superposition, but maybe there is something in nature that produces already superposition of even superpositions, maybe a gravitational field, but we are not aware. Or we, we, so in a gravitational uh, wave ex uh, example, we do not produce gravitational but we can measure it. So maybe there is something also going on where we don't necessarily need to produce a gravitational source in a superposition, or prepare such a thing, but we just measure it. Now, there is a historical example that I like to bring in this respect. And this is a couple of years ago, I was interested in, in macroscopic entanglement witnesses. And it turned out that uh, uh, heat capacity or magnetic susceptibility is an entanglement witness, meaning that you take a piece of solid and, and, and you cool it down and you measure the heat capacity. And out of the value of heat capacity, you know that this heat capacity cannot have this value that you have measured without taking into account the entanglement. Now it's interesting that people mastered measurement of heat capacity before entanglement has been introduced in physics in 1935 by Erwin Schrodinger. So people could have come with the idea of entanglement before entanglement was introduced in quantum theory. Because if they would look at the data and try to simulate or calculate uh, this data with the help of uh, um, separable state, they would fail. So there is, this is kind of optimistic view that maybe there is outside something, and it's and you don't even need the big precision to measure heat capacity. It's a collective phenomenon. Maybe by measuring something, not even precise, measuring some collective phenomena, we see the discrepancy with our current predictions. But maybe indicate that something is going on around without having big effort to put putting a big effort to produce this very non-classical state. Thanks, that's all. I, I think on that very hopeful note that maybe we can come up with something that's creative and, and really fantastic that will allow us to improve our ways to measure these uh, effects and improve these experiments. I think that is a very good way to end it today. And I know there are probably loads of additional questions, um, but we've already taken two hours and I, I would like to thank everyone for staying on for so long. Um, in two weeks time, we're going to start the second block of these series, uh, which will be on classical and quantum sensing with optomechanical mechanical systems. So I think that ties on really well to, to some of the questions we've talked about here. Um, and we'd like to invite you all to attend those talks, um, which will also be finished with a panel discussion on how you build and sell a, an optomechanical mechanical sensor. So I think um, that will be a really interesting intersect between academia and industry as well. Um, so thank you everyone for joining today and especially thank you to all of the pan panel members for their fantastic contributions and thank you to Hendrik for chairing and thank you everyone who asked questions. Um, we hope you have a wonderful evening uh, and we hope to see you in two weeks time.
Thank you, Sophia. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Thank you everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.